you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wonderful introduction. Wonderful to see all of you. Thank you to all the groups and individuals uh, that helped with this and, and to all of you for coming out. Uh, wonderful that you're having a peace camp. That is tremendous. Um, needs to be replicated everywhere. Um, thank you to the uh, captains and crew of the uh, Golden Rule sailboat, the Veterans for Peace anti-nuclear sailboat that I went out on today. There's flyers over there. I uh, reminded uh, by the name of that boat of a presidential primary debate a party called the Republicans had uh, some years back in uh, South Carolina where one candidate uh, said a bunch of anti-war remarks and chunk of the crowd cheered. Another candidate made a bunch of insane pro-war remarks and some part of the audience cheered. And one candidate, a guy named Ron Paul, said, you know, I think maybe we should apply the golden rule to foreign policy and treat other countries the way this country would want those countries to treat it soundly booed by much of the room. Uh, so you can, you can go to a Republican primary debate and get Jesus Christ booed by suggesting that other countries be placed on a some, somewhat similar level with this country, right? So it's not, it's, not, it's not war that's so sacred, it's superiority. That, that's so sacred. So this is a topic I may touch on in my uh, remarks here. I've written some remarks to try to fit a lot in, and then uh, I'll open this up for questions and discussion uh, without a uh, prepared uh, statement. Um, I, 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 I'm the campaign coordinator for RootsAction.org, which is a wonderful organization. I do think I might change that to a uh, companion coordinator, because that did sound better uh, in my introduction there. Um, there, there are three things that are almost always underestimated. The US military budget, altruism, and sadism. First, the military budget. The US military budget, including all things military in various departments, is roughly 60% of federal discretionary spending, meaning the spending that Congress members decide on each year. It is also, by my very rough estimate, the topic of well under 1% of the discussions of government spending engaged in by candidates for Congress. Most Democrats now running for Congress this year have websites that do not even acknowledge the existence of foreign policy beyond expressing their passionate love for veterans. They are campaigning for 40% of a job. U.S. political debate for decades has been framed between those who want a smaller government and fewer social benefits and those who want a larger government and bigger social benefits. So someone like myself who wants a smaller government and bigger social benefits cannot even be comprehended. Yet it shouldn't be so very hard to grasp that if you were to eliminate one little program that makes up 60% of discretionary spending, you could increase many other things and still have a smaller government. The US military budget is over $1 trillion with a T. When you hear an advocate for peace tell you that US wars in recent years have cost some outrageous figure in the hundreds of billions or the low trillions, what they are doing is normalizing most military spending as somehow being for something other than wars. But military spending is, by definition, spending on wars and preparations for more wars. And it is $1 trillion each and every year for that and nothing else. When you hear an advocate for economic fairness tell you how much money you could get by taxing billionaires, it is less than one year's military budget. If you taxed every dime away from every billionaire in the United States, I would throw you a party, I would raise a toast, but the next year, you would have to start in on taxing millionaires because there wouldn't be any billionaires left. In contrast, the trillions for militarism just keep flowing year after year. For a little over 1% of a trillion dollars a year, 
you could end the lack of clean drinking water everywhere on Earth. For about 3% of a trillion dollars a year, you could end starvation everywhere on Earth. For larger fractions, you could put up a serious struggle against climate chaos. You could provide much of the world with cleaner energy, better education, happier lives. And you could make yourself widely loved in the process. While 95% of suicide terrorist attacks in the world are motivated by a desire to get a military occupier to end an occupation, exactly 0% of such attacks thus far have been motivated by resentment of gifts of food, medicine, schools, and clean energy. <laughs> Militarism threatens nuclear apocalypse and is the single biggest cause of climate and environmental collapse, but in the short term, it kills more by the diversion of funds from useful projects than through all the mass murdering horrors of war. That's how big the military budget is. And by horrors of war, I mean to include things like the intentional creation of famine and disease epidemics in places like Yemen, and the creation of life-shortening hells from which refugees flee only to get themselves resented as illegal alien immigrants. Global military spending is roughly $2 trillion a year, meaning that the rest of the world combined makes up roughly another $1 trillion to match the United States' $1 trillion. So now you're talking about a doubly incomprehensible number and a sum capable of doing doubly unimaginable good if converted, redirected, and put to moral use. And I'm not even counting the trillions of dollars of damage that the violence of war does to property each year. Well over three quarters of world military spending is spent by the United States and its close allies and weapons customers whom the US government leans on hard to increase their spending. China spends a fraction of what the United States does, Russia a tiny fraction, and Russia has been reducing its military spending dramatically. Iran and North Korea each spend 1 to 2 percent of what the United States does. This is why the Pentagon has struggled for years now to identify an enemy to justify U.S. military spending. Military officials in recent years, including before and after Trump's arrival in the White House, have openly told reporters that the motivations behind the new Cold War with Russia are bureaucratic and profit-driven. The lack of a credible national enemy has clearly also been a motivation behind the generation, exaggeration, and demonization of smaller non-national, non-governmental enemies as well as the marketing of wars as means to rid small, non-threatening nations of non-existent weapons and to prevent imminent, if fictional, massacres. With the United States in the lead as top weapons dealer to the world, to poor nations, and to dictatorships, it has become unusual not to have U.S. weapons on both sides of a war. And the counterproductive nature of the wars generating more enemies than they eliminate has been well established and conscientiously ignored. As I have said before, given the record of the war on terrorism spreading terrorism, the war on drugs spreading drugs, the war on poverty increasing poverty, I would strongly support a war on prosperity, sustainability, and joy. <laughs> A big chunk of U.S. military spending goes to maintain some thousand military bases in other people's countries. The rest of the world's nations combined maintain a couple of dozen bases outside of their countries. When President Trump recently mentioned ending war rehearsals in Korea and the bare possibility of bringing U.S. troops home from there, many Democratic Party members in Washington, D.C. and in the corporate media nearly lost their minds. Senator Tammy Duckworth immediately introduced legislation to forbid bringing any troops home from Korea, an action she seemed to consider would be an attack on those troops. I need to pause here in my remarks for a few sadly necessary diversions related to personalities, parties, and troops. First, personalities. I do not think any cause is helped by the deification or demonization of any individual politicians. 
I think the best of them in the US government do far more harm than good, and the worst of them do good sometimes. I think activists need to focus on policy, not personality. When Trump was threatening nuclear war on North Korea, I was demanding his impeachment for it. I am still demanding his impeachment for a long list of quintessentially impeachable offenses, none of which, none of which involve unproven and ridiculous accusations of having conspired with Vladimir Putin to besmirch the utterly corrupt, anti-democratic, unverifiable, broken beyond belief U.S. election system. <laughs> but when Trump stopped threatening North Korea and began talking about peace, I didn't need to turn against peace because I'm on the anti-Trump team or a card-carrying member of the so-called resistance that steadily votes Trump bigger war budgets and expanded tyrannical powers. It is fair to recognize that the main thing Trump has done is cease prolonging a crisis of his own buffoonish creation. It's fair to be embarrassed by the propaganda video he showed in Singapore and his dishonest and ignorant discussion of recent events. But the people of South Korea and the world have been demanding an end to the war rehearsals, the so-called war games. When Trump announces something we've been demanding, we ought to express our approval and insist on follow through because we ought to be on the side of peace and not care a fig for being on the side for or against the current king of the cacistocracy. You all know that word, right, cacistocracy? What's a cacistocracy, somebody? R rule by the worst. Uh, in saying that, I am about a trillion, with a T, miles away from supporting Trump for a Nobel Peace Prize. Even, even President Moon, who is far more deserving, is not a peace activist in need of funding for the work of abolishing war. Others in Korea and around the world actually qualify under Alfred Nobel's last will and testament. Uh, there are many of those, yeah, we will discuss uh, some of them. Second, parties. I want to offer a similar caveat about parties. Activism is not served by devotion to a lesser evil political party. If you want to do lesser evil voting on election day, knock yourself out. But if you can't do it without becoming an apologist for the evils of a particular party throughout the year, then it is not a good trade-off. What we do on non-election days, and there are so many more of those, is more important than what we do on election days. Nonviolent activism in all of its millions of forms is what has always changed the world. And the fact that both the lesser and the greater evil continue to steadily grow more evil each election cycle is not an argument for or against lesser evil voting and certainly not an argument for lesser evil activism. Third, the troops. The United States has a poverty draft. No volunteer in its so-called volunteer military is permitted to cease volunteering. The massive budget increases for more weapons are not actually for the troops. No war has ever actually been extended for the benefit of the troops, nor has the ending of any war ever damaged the troops. The top killer of US troops is suicide. The top cause of troops suicide is moral injury, which is to say deep regret for what these young men and women come to realize they were swindled into taking part in namely mass murder. There are zero recorded cases of moral injury or PTSD or brain injury from war deprivation. <laughs> admitting, admitting that this is a cruel system is a first step in fixing it, not a treasonous attack on the troops. Demanding basic human rights like free college, guaranteed retirement, or a habitable future climate for troops and non-troops alike is not anti-troop. Demanding free job retraining for all former troops during a process of conversion to a peaceful economy is not anti-troop. Even if one believes that we ought to stop calling mass murder a service and stop thanking anyone for it, and that people should board airplanes in the fastest rather than the most militarist or the most profitable order, 
that the handicapped rather than the uniformed should get the close parking places at the supermarket and that aircraft carriers should not be used as tourist attractions in non-sociopathic societies. So, so in my view, pollsters who ask if you are pro-war or anti-troop are engaged in a nasty sort of deception. While hashtags that encourage veterans of recent wars to make up their own personal beliefs about what they claim to have been fighting for is pure anti-intellectualism of the worst sort. You may very well favor democracy or freedom or faith or family or any number of other phrases, but that doesn't mean you were sent to Iraq for that purpose or that your being in Iraq served that purpose or that I can't denounce the criminal enterprise you were part of without opposing you and your noble sentiments. A final word on the underestimated military budget before I turn to the underestimated altruism and sadism. Trump has just proposed saving money by merging the education and labor departments, which have nothing whatsoever to do with each other, and now cost a combined 7% or so of the military budget, while Congress is busy cutting food stamps. At the same time, Trump has proposed to create an entire new branch of the US military, a space force. The idea of weaponizing space has been prevalent in the US military since Operation Paperclip, which brought hundreds of former Nazis from Germany to the United States to work in the US military and to develop US rockets and a US space program. The Nazi scientists who worked in Huntsville, Alabama were widely considered by the locals to be what Trump called the fascists who marched through my town of Charlottesville last year. That is, very fine people. A space force is a misnomer, working off troopist propaganda. Trump's proposal is not to send armies into space, but to expand current efforts to send weapons into space. In other words, a space force would consist of weapons makers and make weapons makers into troops whose supposed wishes must be religiously obeyed, even though the only thing preventing a global treaty banning all weapons from space has for many years been the United States government. With weapons companies now flying their own drones for the US military and mercenaries widely employed on the ground, the merging of profiteering with the status of troops is already underway. So the second thing that is often underestimated is altruism. That sounds odd in a conversation about war and peace, but I think it is true nonetheless. Why are people rallying to prevent the separation of refugee parents and children? It's not just taking sides for a political team. People generally do that while solidly seated on their sofas. And it's not selfishness. People are rallying against this cruelty to children and parents because people care about children and parents. Why do millions of people walk and run and otherwise fundraise against cancer and autism? Why do white people wave Black Lives Matter signs and men join in women's marches? Why do people demand rights for other species and ecosystems? Why do people donate to so many charities? Why are non-poor people participating in the poor people's campaign today? The answer is altruism. Altruism is not some sort of logical mystery that needs to be explained any more than air is. We can try to better understand it, but its existence is self-evident. When I wrote a book called When the World Outlawed War about the peace movement of the 1920s, I found that the arguments people used for ending war were moral arguments much more often than today, and that they were much more often successful. In contrast, today and for decades now, we've heard from many peace activists that to mobilize people for peace, you must focus on something that impacts them directly and selfishly. You must focus on US troops with whom they can relate. You must focus on the financial cost to their own bank accounts. You must not expect people to be good or decent or caring. We even have peace activists who join in with the Democratic Congress members who want to compel 18-year-old women to register for any possible draft along with men so that they can be compelled to go to war against their wishes as a remedy for sexist discrimination. Peace activists argue that a draft would mobilize selfish, imaginary, right-wing economic theory persons to finally care about war. 
but drafts do not have a good record of ending wars and do have a good record of facilitating wars. The U.S. draft during the war on Vietnam did not prevent the killing of some six million people, which I do not consider a price worth paying for a larger peace movement, which I think we can get by other means. I think the fact that people will take action for refugee families as soon as the corporate media tells them about those families provides good reason to believe that many would similarly take action for Yemeni or Afghan or Palestinian or other people if they were told about them by corporate or by enlarged independent media. If war victims had names and faces and stories and loved ones, nothing else would be likely to prevent those who care about separating families to care also about killing families or creating orphans via murder instead of via deportation. 